Be here now. Just be here now. Welcome to the Be Here Now Network guest podcast. This series features talks from a myriad of modern spiritual teachers expanding on how we can all live a life in balance. If you're interested in supporting this podcast, please go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash guest. There are many reasons why I'm sitting in this seat. Um, One of them is that I practiced many different traditions my whole life, born a Catholic and um, have deep respect for Jesus, like in a big way, (laughs) as a man that walked this earth and had incredible teachings, just like Muhammad, just like the Buddha. I studied Hinduism for many, many years. I practiced the Red Road for many, many years. Um, and I and I finally landed here about 12 years ago. Not because there was anything wrong with those other traditions, and, and I hold many of them still near and dear in my heart, and there's many parts of it that I still carry, many parts of them that I still carry. But mostly because I'm a rebel, <laughs> and I didn't really want anybody telling me what to do. You know, I didn't want to think that some, like, outside source was responsible for my well-being or not well-being. And I had a lot of friends who sort of treated God like Santa Claus, you know, like (laughs) this is this way of like wish, wish writing. And if you're good, good things happen. And if you're, you know, like, I don't know, there was this interesting way that I didn't, didn't make sense for me. I didn't understand it. And so when I heard that this guy, Siddhartha Gautama, who had walked on this earth as a real man 2,600 years ago, oftentimes said as a prince or as a landowner, a wealthy, wealthy person, um, that he who had everything renounced everything, kind of like you guys are right now. There was somebody in my group today that, Felt like they were in a monastery, and I thought that was beautiful. Renounced everything at a time when the Vedas, the tradition of the Vedas and Brahmanism was what was happening, uh, where only the very educated, wealthy males were... uh, could get educated in any sort of spiritual practice. So that left a lot of people out, as you can imagine, in in India 2,600 years ago. There was a major caste system. So it left probably, you know, 93% of us in the room out. (laughs) I'm just throwing that number out there, but I would have been left out because I'm a woman. So... When the Buddha came along and he had his awakening and Sharon talked about it a bit last night, came across the four messengers and decided to go off and spent his six years. And then he decided, okay, well, I can't imagine that I could teach this to anybody, what I just learned. What I have learned, what I now know is too profound. And most people have too much dust in their eyes, he said. He said, maybe 1% of people don't have dust in their eyes and could understand my teaching. So it's actually a waste of my time. I'm not going to do it. Unfortunately, he got talked into it. And here we sit, right? So I consider us the one percenters. And it's a different type of one percenter (laughs) than what we're used to calling one percenters. But here we sit, you guys 
are the ones who have little dust in your eyes. Even when it's hard, you're still here and willing. Somehow you ended up here. So he was up against, you know, a big big system. Um, But yet when he did decide to teach, when he changed his mind and decided he was going to teach, he taught to everybody. He didn't exclude anyone. So the Brahmins got his teaching, the kings got his teaching, the the farmers, the merchants, but so did the prostitutes and so did the killers. There was nobody he left out. So did the women. (laughs) For a while, he didn't quite let women into the monastic system. He thought it was a bad idea, I think mostly because he was protecting them. He thought they would be unsafe, wandering from village to village and collecting alms and living in homelessness. But eventually, he let the women in too. But what he said was, everybody, nobody is excluded. Nobody is excluded. And I think that's so important, you know, to our population especially, because unfortunately, like, it, the wheel didn't keep spinning in that direction, and certainly not in America. So when I found this and that idea that nobody was excluded, even me, because I'd been excluded so much, I'd even been excluded from my own family, That idea, even me, like even I, have a chance. I want to cry right now. That's so sad. (laughs) It's sad and it's true. He said, not by caste, race, or creed, or birth is one noble, but by heart alone is one a noble being. So it was thought that only by birth could you uh, elevate yourself to the status of any sort of liberation at that time. But for him, it was by character. It was our intrinsic value. It was who we were and are on the inside where our liberation lies not by our skin color, not by our economic status, not by our gender, not by our preferences, not by our disabilities, not by our age. If I left anybody out, please forgive me. There's a lot of isms that we deal with. So what was being said is how how we show up, what our integrity is, how we act, how we love, how we live, how we think is what matters, nothing else. And it was a very pragmatic practice. Like he wasn't big on uh, metaphysics or there, there wasn't a lot of interest in like who could float or who could see through walls, or, you know, those kind of things that were actually quite valued at that time. That wasn't, that wasn't what he was teaching about. He was teaching about, like, in the muck, on the ground, pragmatic, A plus B equals C. Like, if you do this, then that happens. If you don't do this, then that doesn't happen. You know, like, I can compute that. <laughs> I know some of you are like Harvard graduates out there and can do bigger mathematics, but like A plus B, uh, that's not even a formula, right? Okay, one plus two. I don't know, algebra, algebra, (laughs) X and Y. Okay, we'll call it X and Y. So there's something that just feels really nice about knowing that um, what I do or think or say gets to mean something. (laughs) 
And so there's this way that I've I've sort of broken this whole system down in my own head, right? This is this is kind of how I've practiced with it. Because so if what's being said is the things that I do, the things that I say, how I think means something. I know that there's a whole category of things over here that I have no control over. Right? So this is cool. Like I like that. I like knowing that this is true, the things I can control. And then there's this whole category of the things that I can't control. So that's kind of what I want to talk about right now. And I teach to a lot of teen groups and young adults and and things like that. And if you guys were that group, I would say to you, okay, raise your hands. Tell me the things you can control. (laughs) I'm even kind of tempted right now. (laughs) What are some of the things you can control? (laughs) Anybody? <laughs> yes. Pardon? To breathe. Thank you. That makes me want to take a breath. <laughs> what else can we can we control? Responses. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, oh gosh, darn it. <laughs> yes, you're right. Is that true? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I, it's not as fun with you guys. <laughs> okay, so, so, the, the, so the, in a way, it's like the things I can control, then I know what to spend my energy on, Right? The things I can't control, why am I going to put a whole lot of energy there? Because then I'm just spinning and spinning and spinning. I I listened to this um, NPR story once, um, and it was a it was a young man who had killed a woman in a in a car crash, right? Or yeah, she was walking and he hit her and killed her. And he literally, this was a story twenty years later, and he was still suffering deeply because of it. And part of the story that as it comes out is part of his suffering is because because he was texting at the time that it happened, right? And so there, these studies have been done with people that have accidentally killed other people. These studies have been done where when there was something they could have done differently, they don't heal. Their trauma doesn't heal as quickly as if it was not their fault. So if the brakes didn't work, if the person was in complete darkness, you know, they just didn't see them, those people heal from the trauma quicker than the people who had some sort of onus in it. And I found that so interesting in this regard, right? Because what do I have, what do I have control over? I have control over what I say. So the precepts that we took the first day that we came, those five things are things that we have a level of control over. Our intentionality to not cause harm by killing another living being. I had an ant crawling on my foot today while I was writing this talk and I was thinking about you guys. It was huge. It was an ant. This You guys have huge ants here, huh? <laughs> it was massive. I was like, I'm not going to kill it. I'm not going to kill it. I'm not going to kill it. Um, you know, so this way that uh, we can take these ethical practices. What do I have control over? My ethical conduct, the way I show up, Am I going to cause harm through my, through harming another living being, through taking something that isn't mine, which I could do a series on taking things that aren't freely given. How do we take other people's time? You know, how do we take from our offices because we're like, well, they have lots of toilet paper. They won't miss this role. <laughs> I remember when I was 20, I used to like, think that the toilet paper at the place I worked was my toilet paper. (laughs) And so I would take the toilet paper and nobody's laughing because none of you have clearly done that before. Okay, staples, paper clips. 
paper, <laughs> post-its, something, right? <laughs> the way that we just take things that aren't freely given. I think speech, speech for me is the hardest one. Speech for me is the biggest one. I used to be the forked tongue assassin in elementary school. My friends would hire me to hurt people they didn't like <laughs> because I could do it and I liked it. And I've kind of grown out of it for the most part, but it's in there. You know, I'm, con I'm conditioned deeply around that. And I have a lot of regret around it. So there's this way, like the things I can control. One of my big litmus tests is when I lay in bed at night, am I at ease? You know, if I review my day, can I lay there with a, a mind free? If I can't, I really, really try to make reparations. It's important to me. But I find that I don't sleep as well at night if I've caused harm than if something has happened to me or somebody I love. And I don't know that that's true for everybody, but there's something about that for me that's really big. So a few ways that this practice, I mean, I'm gonna, I was all worried about time and not having enough to say, and I'm just going to blab and not have enough time. So uh, a few of the points that I want to point out um, around the things that I can control um, and the very important characteristics around Buddhism is one, this, this ethical practice that I'm pointing out. You and your actions and your speech are important. Um, another is this idea of self-reliance. That um, the key to liberation on this path is around our mental clarity, our clarity of heart and mind, this chitta that Larry was talking about, not around an outside authority. And the, the teachings or the suttas sort of say that the Buddha said, be a refuge unto yourself. He said, don't look at me, look at the moon. Like, take these teachings as your own, not on anyone else's authority. And this moves into the next point, which is around experiment and experiential. This is a very experimental and experiential practice. And I talked to a few of you about this today, is we are pointing out a few skillful means to you in the morning um, instructions, and then now in these talks and during the metta period. But someone once, one of our scholarly Buddhist people counted up, there's something like 80,000 skillful means, 80,000 upaya, we call skillful means of how to practice, how to reach liberation on this path. That's a lot. That's a lot of different ways to practice. And so what the offering is to us as practitioners is not to, you know, we can sit in the room with you guys and do our very best to have something to say to maybe help you through your day. Right? We might have some piece of advice or practice information that might help you. And ultimately, what you guys need to do is go out and practice with it and try it on and see if it works. It takes some courage. It takes some level of bravery. But these skillful means that we're practicing with need to actually be, be used and tried. So there's something about that that I love. I get to be self-reliant. For someone that was saying I was a rebel and I left other traditions because I didn't really want to do what someone else said, this is saying be self-reliant, experiment, work with your own personal ethics, see how you feel at the end of a day, right? 
And then one that I don't want to get into too much, and I'm just going to touch on very lightly, and I'm going to say the word even on a little bit of hesitation, but it's this word karma that we talk about. And I, I'm not going to talk about it in terms of rebirth or other lives or anything like that, but just in terms of cause and effect, moment-to-moment experience, how one moment affects the next, how one mind moment, so let's just get a little tweaky in our minds for a second, okay? So right now what you're thinking And in which direction you're thinking, whether you're having a positive experience, a not-so-positive experience, what your mood is like, what your attitude is like, is actually creating the next little burst of mind moment, right? So in a way, if we think of rebirth, and this is how I like to look at the idea of rebirth, is we are rebirthing every moment We are creating our next birth by our mind right now. And when I figured that out, I remember being on retreat and I was doing the Vedana practice. For about two weeks, I decided I was going to do, I was on retreat for quite a while and I decided I was going to do the practice that Sharon introduced this morning the pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. And all I did with every moment, I'm going to encourage this practice for you guys because it's actually quite interesting if you're into that sort of thing. (laughs) Every moment, whether it was a thought, whether it was a physical sensation, whether it was an emotion, whether it was something I was seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, everything I labeled with pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. Pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. And I saw how I was creating each moment dependent upon whether it was pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Because the pleasant moved me into and towards the thing I thought I wanted, right? So I, I was creating myself into being in that moment. Am I being too weird right now? Okay. <laughs> I'm feeling a little weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just like talking about this stuff. And then and then if I if a mo- if something was just simply labeled unpleasant, I could see like everything in my whole being was moving away from. There's a, a female Thai teacher, Ajahn Neb, she says that every movement that we make is a movement away from suffering. And I thought that was so interesting. And of course, I've tweaked out on that for a while too. You know, so just, and not even in a big way, you know, just even like a full bladder, unpleasant, we go to the bathroom. Empty stomach, unpleasant, we eat, right? But even if I were, you're scratching your head, (laughs) you had a little itch, you scratched it, right? Like everything that we do, Or even when we move on our cushion, it's a movement out of and away from discomfort in some way or another, right? And so what we're asking ourselves to do when we're sitting on the cushion and not moving is radical. Because our inclination, our even our survival mechanisms are telling us to move away from that which is uncomfortable. I was doing a teen retreat and there was a lot of flies. And I got all these kids practicing with flies <laughs> and just getting into like, oh, wow, those are just all they are. Time. You know, because first they're swatting, 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 and everything was disturbed because of the swatting. And finally, you know, by day three, they're like, oh, tiny little feet walking on my face, you know, <laughs> tiny little feet crawling up my nose. <laughs> it was just like, whoa, that's all it is. Aversion. Suddenly aversion just became like this kind of cool, interesting, intimate thing, right? Not a big deal. Not a problem. So when I think of cause and effect, when I think of of karma, moment to moment, 
And we get to kind of do that on retreat since everything is slowed down so much. We kind of really get to just freak out on it, you know, and just really pay close attention. Walk as slow as you want. Like feel, feel something and, and wonder, oh, do I really need to move right now? Can I just maybe not? What would that be like? What does the complaining mind start to do? Oh, I feel really constricted when that happens. What happens when it doesn't matter so much? Oh, I feel really open when that happens. It's just kind of fun. Like on day three, you know, by tomorrow, you guys will even be (laughs) slower. (laughs) So it's kind of, I'm I'm encouraging sort of the, the curiosity, the interest in these things that, that might feel uncomfortable, but just let them, like, explore them a little bit. Be with them a little bit. See how we create the next moment because of our aversion or our greed. And then delusion is just a whole other, like, ball of wax that's so complicated. Um, so those are the things that right now, like, What can I control? And then there's the things that we can't control. And there's there's a lot of them. Don't want to do a hand raise again? (laughs) Anybody? (laughs) No? (laughs) Yes! (laughs) And the kids usually say, my parents. Yeah, that's other people cannot control. Who wants to control other people in this room? Everybody. (laughs) We all want to control other people. Yeah. What else? What? Thank you. (laughs) She was with me the other day. We talked about this. (laughs) Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't hear you back there. Hatred. Hatred. Oh, gosh. Aging. Aging. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a big one. And how often do we sit here? Like, how many of you have been sitting here trying to reconfigure your past? <laughs> like, if I think about it a thousand times, I'm sure I can change it. <laughs> how many more, you know, how many times can I think about it? Surely it'll change doesn't happen. What I like about that one, the past one, this is a non sequitur over here sort of thought about it, but what I learned about that, like through my forgiveness practice, was like how I could change the past was by making sure I didn't do it again. By actually really learning from what maybe my part was in the past. So I'm going to start with the one you brought up, Renee. Um, Just sort of that universality, universality of of suffering, things we can't control. I remember when Steve Jobs died, and I was like, well, surely he could afford the cure, right? Like, if he he can die with all that money, (laughs) shoot, that means all of us are going to die. So that was one of the Buddha's big teachings, this old age, sickness, and death. Again, the, 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 four, the three of the four messengers. Not getting what we want and getting what we don't want. The things we can't control, that's universal. It doesn't matter you know, again, the caste system didn't matter, the age didn't matter, the color didn't matter, the money didn't matter, the power didn't matter. It doesn't matter. Like, no one is excluded from that. So, things I can't control. Old age, sickness, death. We don't know when, we don't know how. I don't mean to be spooky and scary right now. But it's just one of those things that was being pointed to in First Noble Truth over and over again. This idea of when we can really 
understand that, or as Ajahn Sumedho says, when we can stand under that knowing, it's really different than that knowing. Some of the other, some of the other things um, that we can't control. In the suttas, they're called the ni- niyamas um, or natural laws, and one of them is, is simply nature, nature itself. You know, you might plan your trip to Jamaica, and it might rain the whole time, <laughs> and you know, that, there's not a lot we can do about that. I mean, now with, with climate change, I think that there's a different conversation, of course, around this, and I'm, and I'm highly aware of that. So when I say this, there's a, you know, this other part of me that knows, um, well, that's not entirely true, Joanna. Like There are parts and aspects of climate that we do have control over. But 2,600 years ago, they didn't have this problem. So I'm just, you know, talking about what the Buddha talked about. But another thing, and, and our dear friend and fellow teacher Anushka, she does this a lot. Um, you know, one of the other natural laws that we don't have control over is gravity, right? So when, uh, when I hold something in my hand and I turn it over and I open my hand, what's going to happen? It's going to fall, Right? And so, like, I could do it again and say, well, I'm a really good person. Like, I said all my prayers today, and I was nice to everybody I know, and I ate all my vegetables. Maybe this time it's not going to fall. And it's like, no, if I open my hand, it's going to (laughs) fall. It's just the way it is, right? And there's a way that, interestingly, we accept accept that. We accept past age two, we accept that. (laughs) If you know anybody below age two, they don't really necessarily accept gravity. Over 50, like, I I don't want to accept gravity, (laughs) but I have to. (laughs) You know, it's like gravity is real. And it's one of those natural laws that we really can't argue with. Another one is heredity. Just another one of the natural laws. My, my mother, my poor mother. I love my mother sometimes. Um, <laughs> my mother was born in 1931 in Harlem, a very light-skinned black woman. And she decided like when, you know, because she lived during Jim Crow. She married a white guy when mis- misogyny was not legal, you know, like it was against the law when she married my father. Um, so she decided she was going to pass for white. That was, that was her thing, right? So she left Harlem because she was treated really poorly in Harlem. They threw rocks at her in Harlem. She had, did not have a good time there. So I, don't, I cannot blame her for what she did. She moved away and she decided, I'm going to raise my kids up white, right? So I had my hair straightened my, most of my life. And I really felt like my mom didn't like me very much, <laughs> And that was hard. That was hard. We've resolved a lot of that now. But then what I went and did was I married a black man and I had black babies. <laughs> and so this heredity thing, like she could not get away from it, right? No matter what. <laughs> and we can, we can laugh and my mom still doesn't like black people. But it's... <laughs> <laughs> and I, like my aunties actually said to me when I married, you know, I've been married twice. The first husband was Puerto Rican. And they were like, are you sure you want us to come? These are my aunties in Harlem. And I was like, well, why wouldn't you come? And they said, well, does he know you're black? And I was like, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> but they were protecting me. You know, in their mind, they were protecting me. So anyway... Heredity. <laughs> like no matter what seed, those seeds that we plant, they're going to grow, right? So the other thing that we cannot control, um, and I think this one's really interesting because we feel like we can, but it's the workings of the mind. 
So chitta nimaya, the workings of the mind. And what that means, what's that, what that's pointing to is not our perception, but it's our, when our eyes see, our mind knows something. Like that is going to happen. What it knows is you know, up for grabs. But our eyes are going to see. You are, you are not in control. If your eyes are open and you have the ability to see, your eyes are going to see. The hearing, like the construction that was going on outside, we don't have an on-off switch, right? If we did, we would. Like, okay, that's not working right now. I'm going to turn it off. We don't have that capacity. Feeling warm or cold or, you know, and this is all if we're in a body that um, is it, it can accept these things. These are not optional. We don't get to control that. Those are out of our control. And then the interdependence of all being, the thing beings, the things that everything rises, everything exists, and everything ceases. Not in our control. Yet, so often, we want to, uh, right? We want to do something so that we can change that. And so what the, what the Buddha was proposing is so, so radical. And sometimes I even feel like I shouldn't even be teaching this because it's, it's, it's not a self-help book. He was not proposing like self-help tactics. He, what he was saying, what he was talking about was full liberation. Full and complete liberation. And that's not like that that means some big stuff. That means we have to really understand some things that we just don't always want to understand. We have to hold some things that we don't really always want to hold. And it's painful. And it's heavy. And it's beautiful. And it's complete. Because it, it's true, right? It's true that in this form, in this human birth, my friend Mary, who's a teacher, she says from the mo- you know, somebody might have said this before her, she might be copying somebody, but from the moment you are born, you agreed to die, Right? And then there's everything in between. And that's, that's what's true. And then what do we get to do? How fully can we inhabit these? They're just flesh suits. Like we're living in some flesh and bones and pus and stuff, right? And then we get the opportunity to inhabit these forms here. So holding, what can I control? What can't I control? If we take the burden off of ourselves of what we can't control, that's a, that's a big burden to get to relieve ourselves from. I, th- I think, maybe I'm crazy. But it kind of, another reason why I came to this practice is that feels like such a relief for me. I don't need to, I don't, I, not even do I not need to do that stuff, but I can't do that stuff. So my jurisdiction are the things that I can, which is how I behave, where I let my mind sort of play and go and wander, how I practice, how I show up to friends and family, how I view others, right? These are things that I get to, I get to actually have control over. There's this beautiful poem by Thich Nhat Hanh that I'm going to read and then we'll sit for a minute. I can't control it. I can't see anymore. So I wear glasses. It's that simple. Um... It really uh, sort of what 
what's the word I'm looking for? It just shows <laughs> when I'm talking about this holding of ourselves in the multiplicity of our beings, in the multiplicity of how we show up in the world. Sometimes, sometimes we're glorious and beautiful and and great, and sometimes we're God, I want to cut so bad, and I'm not supposed to in here. Like, it's so inhibiting. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> and, and sometimes we're just real dum dums. <laughs> sometimes we just really blow it. <laughs> and we don't get it right sometimes. <laughs> And one of the things I love about the precepts is, you know, I read, it's for nobody else to judge. The precepts are for nobody else to judge you on. They're only for, they're for us. Like I said, like, well, how do I fall asleep at night? So what this poem is about is the multiplicity of all the ways that we are in the world, all the things that we have to hold for ourselves and for others. And it's called, Call Me By My True Names. And I'm sure many of you have probably heard this. Do not say that I'll depart tomorrow, because even today I still arrive. Look deeply. I arrive in every second to be a bud on a spring branch, to be a tiny bird with wings still fragile, learning to sing in my new nest, to be a caterpillar in the heart of a flower, to be a jewel hiding itself in a stone. I still arrive in order to laugh and to cry, in order to fear and to hope. The rhythm of my heart is the birth and death of all that are alive. I am the mayfly metamorphosing on the surface of the river, and I am the bird which, when spring comes, arrives in time to eat the mayfly. I am the frog swimming happily in the clear pond. And I am the grass snake who, approaching in silence, feeds itself on the frog. I am the child in Uganda, all skin and bones, my legs as thin as bamboo sticks. And I am the arms merchant selling deadly weapons to Uganda. I am the 12-year-old girl refugee on a small boat, who throws herself into the ocean after being raped by a sea pirate. And I am the pirate, my heart not yet capable of seeing and loving. I am a member of the Politubro with plenty of power in my hands. And I am the man who has to pay his debt of blood to my people, dying slowly in a forced labor camp. My joy is like spring, so warm it makes flowers bloom in all walks of life. My pain is like a river of tears, so full it fills the four oceans. <clears throat> Excuse me, it fills the four oceans. Please call me by my true names so I can hear all my cries and laughs at once, so I can see that my joy and pain are one. Please call me by my true names so I can wake up. And so the door of my heart can be left open, the door of compassion. So let's just sit for a moment. This by Harriet Tubman. If you hear the dogs, keep going. If you see the torches in the woods, keep going. If they're shouting after you, keep going. Don't ever stop. Keep going. If you want a taste of freedom, keep going. <laughs> 